Hello, and welcome to San Francisco Ballet's Point of View Lecture Series. My name is Cecilia Beam, and I'm a program coordinator in the Department of Education and Training, and we are pleased to provide this free lecture series to the public. Before the pandemic, Points of View lectures were held in the War Memorial Opera House on Wednesday evenings. We're continuing that tradition, and we will offer a new Points of View lecture on Wednesdays following the initial stream of each of San Francisco Ballet's programs throughout the digital season. This conversation has been pre-recorded in order to accommodate our panelist schedules. You can find the full list of discussions and whether they are streamed live or pre-recorded on our website at sfballet.org slash events. Today, Dr. Carrie Geyser Casey will make a presentation on Alexei Romansky's Symphony No. 9. Following her presentation, she will be in conversation with principal dancer Doris Andre and soloist Jana Franciconis. And now let me introduce our presenter. Carrie Geyser Casey is a dance researcher, writer, and educator. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and has twice served as San Francisco Ballet Scholar in Residence. Her publications have appeared in Theater Journal, Dance Chronicle, and various anthologies. She is a frequent lecturer for San Francisco Ballet, Cal Performances, and American Ballet Theater. And now I'll turn it over to Carrie. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Cecilia. I'm very excited to be here today speaking with two incredible SFB dancers, soloist Jana Franciconis and principal dancer Doris Andre about one of my favorite ballets, choreographer Alexei Rotmansky's Symphony No. 9. I'm speaking with you today in my capacity as scholar in residence at SFB. With this unique program, SFB supports scholarly research on topics related to the ballet's repertoire. In 2019, which seems like a long time ago, I had the privilege of spending three weeks in the studio with Jana and Doris during the staging of another Rotmansky ballet, The Seasons. The San Francisco premiere was of course postponed due to the pandemic, but hopefully we will get to see this other masterpiece of Rotmansky's again soon. It seems fitting to me, however, given the pandemic that we're discussing Rotmansky's Symphony No. 9 tonight with music to, to Dmitry Shostakovich. One of the themes of this ballet is about how artists work under difficult conditions to create art, which has certainly been the case for our dancers and choreographers this past year. Tonight, I'll give some context to the ballet before we move on to speak with Jana and Doris. May I have the first slide, please? Okay, am I good to go? Okay. First, the choreographer. Alexei Rotmansky is one of the most gifted and sought after choreographers working today. He received his training at the Bolshoi Ballet School in Moscow and returned to the Bolshoi to direct from 2008 to 2013 after enjoying an international career as a dancer. Currently, Rotmansky serves as artist in residence at American Ballet Theater, a position he has held for 11 years. San Francisco Ballet has the distinction of having been the first American company Rotmansky choreographed on, his Carnival of the Animals in 2003, and he also choreographed from Foreign Lands in 2013 on the company. We can move to the next slide, please. Rotmansky's story is tied up with the story of Russia's opening to the West in the late 1980s when Rotmansky was graduating from the Bolshoi Ballet School. The Bolshoi Ballet had a very set repertory at this time. Ballets such as the company's calling card Spartacus relied on a heroic, virtuosic, monumental style of dancing and didn't venture far beyond the format of the full length narrative ballet. And let's get that slide of Spartacus. Soviet ballet did not uh, enjoy the same degree of experimentation with the shorter abstract or pure dance ballets, such as those by George Balanchine. But in the 1980s, when Rotmansky was still in the ballet school, bootleg videotapes of ballets by Western choreographers began to trickle into the Soviet Union. 
He calls this a kind of aha moment for him and recounted in an interview how watching George Balanchine's Apollo for the first time really opened up this new world of possibilities for him. Next slide, please. Rotmoski is also something of a ballet historian or even a ballet archeologist. He has re reconstructed from notational sources stored in the Harvard Theater Collection, a number of iconic ballets by Marius Petipa. These are works like Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, and La Bayadere, all dating from the pre-revolutionary golden age of imperial ballet in the late 19th century. He learned to read this notation alongside of his wife, Tatiana, and brought back to life an alternative view of what these ballets may have looked like closer to the time of their premiere. Next slide, please. Also, while at the Bolshoi, he revived several ballets from the 1930s Soviet era, which I have to say has not been um, an era of ballet that has received a whole lot of attention. This was the era of socialist realism, the official aesthetic doctrine. Uh, from this time, we have The Bright Stream. This is his remake of the 1935 ballet. It's set on a collective farm. And also Bolt, a 1931 ballet about a factory saboteur. Both of these had scores by Shostakovich. As Alistair Macaulay, the former New York Times dance critic pointed out, Mr. Rotmansky's abiding subject often seems to be a Russia of the imagination. There's been a tendency in his work to date toward Russian themes, Russian history, identity, and culture. We see this especially in some of his more recent folklore tinge ballets like Odessa, Songs of Bukovina, and also Russian Seasons, which was performed here in San Francisco in, I believe, 2006. This turn to Russia has much to do with the fact that throughout his career, Ramansky has been systematically working through a list of Russian composers he has been wanting to create ballets to. And at the top of that list, no doubt, is 20th century Russian composer, Dmitry Shostakovich. Next slide, please. Between 2012 and 2013, Rotmansky choreographed an evening of abstract ballets to the music of Shostakovich entitled the Shostakovich Trilogy. The three ballets which comprise the evening are Symphony No. 9, the Chamber Symphony, and Piano Concerto No. 1, all take their titles from the names of Shostakovich's compositions. Symphony No. 9 is the first ballet of the evening, and it's more frequently excerpted and performed alone. Could I get the next slide, please? Chamber Symphony is a psychological and semi-biographical portrait of the composer. Uh, next slide, please. While Piano Concerto No. 1 is a tribute to Shostakovich's music. The trilogy was choreographed on American Ballet Theater as a co-production with San Francisco Ballet. The ballets premiered in San Francisco in 2014 and were an instant and unqualified success. However, the positive reception was definitely not a foregone conclusion. In fact, it was rather daring of Rutlansky and American Ballet Theater and San Francisco Ballet to create a full evening of abstract ballets to Shostakovich. This is not what immediately comes to mind as audience friendly. In general, Shostakovich has not been a composer of choice for 20th and 21st century choreographers in stark contrast to his contemporary Igor Stravinsky. In fact, New Yorker dance critic Arlene Croce famously declared in 1967 that every ballet she had ever seen to Shostakovich had been bad. However, since a young age, Rotmansky has had a strong affinity with Shostakovich's music, purchasing recordings of the sixth and ninth symphonies as a teenager and setting his first choreographic essays to the composer. For artists of Rotmansky's generation in the Soviet Union, Shostakovich was viewed as a kind of idol and role model because of how he endured the periods of artistic repression during the Soviet regime. The trilogy is really about Shostakovich as understood and depicted through the eyes of Rotmansky. It's about life in Soviet Russia and it's about creating art under circumstances of tremendous difficulty. 
Ratmansky said of Shostakovich, he was a survivor who wore masks to create and live. Next slide, please. The music. Shostakovich completed the Symphony No. 9 in E-flat major, Opus 70, in August of 1945, after the end of World War II. Originally, he conceived of, of the ninth as a bookend to the seventh and eighth symphonies, both of which celebrated the extremely hard-won Russian victory over the Nazis in World War II, and both of which were correspondingly solemn, weighty, and heroic in tone. The ninth proved to be something altogether different. It has an almost sarcastic, even slapstick mood in places, but this lightheartedness is continually undermined by plummets into panic, anxiety, and despair. There is a more personal sense of terror in Symphony No. 9. This is not the fear of people facing an external enemy like Nazi Germany, but the terror of people afraid of their own government and of each other. The symphony was denounced by the authorities for its ideological weakness and was banned from performance. After this, Shostakovich did not write another symphony until eight years later, in 1953, after the death of Stalin. This was a very common pattern in his career. He would be celebrated as a Soviet composer promoted by the authorities internationally as a symbol of Soviet cultural superiority. And then he'd write something that didn't please the authorities and he'd lose his professorships at the conservatories and his standing in important musical organizations. In part because Shostakovich was always playing this dance with the authorities, his music has often invited interpretations that focus on the many layers of his compositions. And in particular, the question of if he was including some sort of secret subversive message in his work. Structurally, in his music, there almost always seems to be a kind of subtext, such as in his frequent inclusion of citations from his other compositions, and also his use of an autobiographical signature, his initials DSCH, translated into a refrain of four notes. And this is especially prominent in the second ballet of the trilogy, The Chamber Symphony. These layers in Shostakovich's music seem particularly attractive to Ratmansky. He stated in an interview that Shostakovich's way of reflecting reality was hugely influential on him. In particular, that ballet shouldn't be one color. Both artists seem to delight in shifting the, the colors of a piece, the moods, the point of view, the messages, combining the tragic with the comic or alternating ironic distancing with startling honesty. Next slide, please. I'll give one example of how this plays out choreographically in Symphony No. 9, in how the dancers of the, the ensemble play different roles in the ballet. In the first movement, the ensemble begins with an attitude of uh, forced optimism, almost threatening in its vigor, shown through virtuosic steps demanding an attack, aggressive pique steps toward a central figure, and arm movements mimicking drum playing in a military parade. As the ballet progresses, the aggressors become the victims in a movement sequence that resembles a stylized slow motion mass execution by firing squad. Standing in line formations, their bodies fall, jerking to their knees, then to their sides, then to their backs. Finally, stillness reigns. Next slide, please. We can also see Ratmansky's embracing of all the colors in a ballet and how the Shostakovich trilogy also celebrates the youthful idealism of the young Soviet nation. And you can see here some of the symbols on the backdrop by George Sipen in Symphony No. 9. We have athletes, shiny red planes, uh, zeppelins, wholesome looking youth. This idealism, this hopefulness was real, even if it ended tragically. And Ratmansky also includes this aspect of the early Soviet era as well in his trilogy. The ballet, like the symphony, is in five parts. There's no linear narrative, only situations and relationships which change and regroup as quickly as the music does. However, Nancy Rafa, who is the director of repertoire at American Ballet Theater and who frequently stages Ratmansky's ballets for San Francisco Ballet, 
offered the following thematic outline for the ballet. In the first movement, she said, the dancers are representing the authorities, the official party line, the people who wrote the list for execution. The mood is ironic. And this is the movement where Doris is playing the, um, one of the lead principals alongside of Joseph Walsh. The second movement concerns fear and artistic persecution. There's one main couple in this piece played here by Jennifer Stahl and Aaron Robeson. Rafa mentioned Shostakovich and his wife hiding in their apartment, waiting for a knock on the door is the, the image that Rotmansky may have been working with. In an interview, however, Rotmansky stated that the clarinet theme reminded him of a scene from Soviet era writer Mikhail Bulgakov's novel, The Master and Margarita, in which the two main characters, a persecuted writer and his lover, hide from the world in the writer's basement apartment, trying to safeguard their only happiness. The third movement reflects the optimism of the early Soviet era and introduces a solitary male figure whom Rafa stated is like an angelic figure in the ballet, but who more, more than one Russian commentator described as the character Woland from Bulgakov's book. And Woland is actually Satan who has come to judge the city of Moscow, but in spite of being Satan, he ends up being a force for good. The fourth movement concerns sort of reality crashing in on the optimism, the loss of friends and family, the devastation of the war, and then the fifth movement sums up everything that has come before, but also reaches for hope for the future and that the Russian people will come through. Can I get the next slide, please? So let's now turn to our two dancers, principal dancer Doris Andre and soloist Jana Frensikonis, who can provide us with more insight into this complex ballet. And I have to say, these are truly two of the most uniquely gifted artists working today. Jana, who hails from Tucson, Arizona, was promoted to soloist in 2017 after two years in the corps de ballet at San Francisco Ballet. She came to San Francisco from Pacific Northwest Ballet and apparently auditioned on a whim while visiting her brother, who was at the San Francisco Ballet School at the time. Director Helgi Thomason immediately recognized what Jana had to offer in his words, stage presence, musicality, and versatility. In the studio, she combines a total commitment and focus with a positive presence. She seems to brighten the room wherever she goes. And San Francisco ballet audiences have been delighted by how she makes even the simplest of steps seem more interesting and how she commands and eats up space. Doris was born in Vijo, Spain, where she received her early training. She joined SFB in 2004, was promoted to soloist in 2012, and then principal dancer in 2015. And apparently Doris actually broke her leg when she was first launching as a dancer, which is a potentially career ending injury. <laughs> and- uh, <laughs> I broke my foot, not my leg, but- Oh, you broke your foot, okay. Same anyway, it's still a potentially career ending injury. Thank you for the correction. Um, but we're all very grateful that she stuck with ballet. As an artist, Doris is an experimenter and a risk taker. She thinks like a choreographer. This may be why so many choreographers are drawn to create ballets on her. She's constantly moving in the studio, trying out new ways to do a step or working on tricky partnering. Her work ethic, which is really quite something, is matched only by her talent. She is also a costume designer, a swimmer, and is pursuing a graduate degree in industrial design from the University of Barcelona. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask both of you just to, in a sense, get this question out of the way, um, how you've been surviving and or thriving during the time of COVID-19. Hi, first off, this is, this is what the world looks like right now. Hi, Jana. I haven't seen you forever. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. Um, it's, I mean, it's been hard. I think like um, the begin, like the first four months for me were very hard. Then I got used to it and actually started finding the positives in it. 
I've never had time to do anything that I wanted more than the school and work. So it's been really nice to actually paint again and do other projects that I haven't had any time to do. So, you know, but I mean, that's just like trying to find, uh, you know, like the positive in it. I miss the stage a lot. Um, we're still working, but performing is, performing is really fun. And stop talking, I talk a lot. That's great. <laughs> it was, a, yeah, that was a great explanation. It was the same for me, actually. I think it was so, it was such shock. I, I mean, immediately we were canceled overnight. So that was kind of something we had to get used to. And then like everyone, we had no idea what was going on. So you had the hope of, oh, two weeks, we'd have a performance, oh, four weeks. And now it's almost a year later, we're still not on the stage. So uh, it was difficult. I was like Doris, there was a moment in the quarantine that I sort of flipped my mindset. And like she said, finally had time. So I ended up taking a ton of classes um, on Zoom, which actually turned out really cool because I, I've now studied with schools in like London, New York, LA, San Francisco, places I never would have been able to before. So that's a, it's a small lining, but it is one. Yeah, so important to find those silver linings. Otherwise you, <laughs> you just kind of lose it after a while. Um, let's go ahead and turn to symphony number nine. Um, Jana, I read that you trained as a pianist for 10 years. Um, both classically and also learning improvisational jazz. And I was curious if this training helps you with Shostakovich's music, which I imagine is quite difficult to count. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how that helps you. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of have a funny story because I, when um, my brother was training with the Dutch National Ballet Trainee Program, I went to visit him and Dutch National happened to be doing Shostakovich trilogy. And I watched their, yeah, I watched their dress rehearsal. And I remember the first thought being, man, that must be so hard to count. Because um, where my piano training uh, came in, I think in my early age, I definitely didn't analyze it too much. I knew I was a musical dancer. I knew I loved music. I knew when I listened to music, I was immediately trying to pick up the counts and uh, the layers of the left hand and the right. But it wasn't until later in my dance career that I realized how much that helped me actually when it comes to a piece like Shostakovich, which is at some points, I always say it's kind of memorizing pi. It's like a nine, a four, a seven, a three, you know, it's, and then there's like silent notes. And so in that sense, piano has helped me enormously. And also just understanding you've talked a lot about the complexities of, of Alexei and Shostakovich and how physically you can look at the piano of your left hand doing a certain thing and your right hand doing a certain thing. And that's the same exact thing that Alexei likes in his dancing. You, uh, something that comes to mind is your feet will be doing small little jumps and your upper body will be doing something very slow and thick. Um, so physically piano has helped me a lot. Um, musically and yeah I'm just I'm so fortunate that I was able to study for as long as I did and and now I still play but I'm not training anymore but um yeah it, and Shostakovich is almost impossible but it's funny because when you when you know it you know it and that's the good thing about it is you're not going to lose the musicality because you know you really it's ingrained in in your soul <laughs> and then you can just dance but yeah piano is um I'm always just so fortunate that I learned a musical instrument and stuck with it for so long. So yeah, that answered the question. <laughs> do, do you think it's harder to dance to than Stravinsky or harder to count than Stravinsky? Shostakovich is a bit more layered, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I was having a tr trouble uh, in symphony number no. nine, there's this peppy music, but then underneath it is this really low kind of dark, uh, sort of suppressed sounding music mm. and I was I would get confused which one we were supposed to be counting so yeah for me the layers are extremely difficult because I hear all of the different melodies going on and then I sometimes I just don't know which one people are talking about um, 
Yeah, Stravinsky is hard though because that's another pie counter. It's like you mm -hmm. just you if if you're off, it's very obvious. <laughs> but yeah, that's okay. why I would say Shostakovich is a bit dif more difficult for me. Doris, I saw you nodding your head that you also think Shostakovich is more difficult than Stravinsky. I don't just because um, I think Shostakovich is um, more layer, just like Janet said, but I think it's much more melodic. And I'm, yeah, me, I'm a person that like, I can't, I can, if I have to count, I'll count. But in general, the musicality kind of just like happens. Yeah. Um, and I don't remember it. I've also done it a few, like a bunch, the trilogy. And I remember actually Danita on, on the wings when you're like, which one? Because it, uh, Chambers is like so repetitive. Mm. <laughs> And there's like the chorus has the same entrances, similar entrances, and it's it's very confusing. And if you've only done the ballet once, and you haven't had a chance to rehearse a lot, um, it can be very. And I have done it a lot, and I rehearsed with with Alexi. So yeah. I was like, no, and I don't know how I know. I just know that she has to because I used to do her part. I was just like, go now. <laughs> so yeah, like I think. It's melodic, so your body and your mind remembers it better. Mm -hmm. Like I still, I perform vi violin concerto without knowing, like anything. I, it was terrifying. Well, I think it helps that, um, you know, in the case of violin concerto, Balanchine is such a musical choreographer, um, and I think Rotmansky too is a very musical choreographer, and in some ways that perhaps that makes your job easier. Yes, um, Violin Concerto and, and Agon, Agon actually, Agon especially, I, I have nightmares about it still. So, <laughs> I remember feeling like a fish. I was just like trying to look, make sure that, <laughs> am I just going rogue on the side? <laughs> uh, Balanchine's choreography is to, to Stravinsky is very bare. So it's like, if you are off, the whole audience will know. They're gonna know, yeah. <laughs> so Doris, um, sorry, my, as per <laughs> usual, things need to be charged. Uh, you can, sorry, you can continue, I'm just. Um, so we see you, you feature especially in the opening movement of Symphony Number no. 9. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really struck, struck by Nancy Rafa's description of who your character is supposed to be um, this kind of like person representing the Soviet authorities. And I was curious, do you think of it that way? Um, or how do you think of it? I, I really like, I really like the way Nancy sets that is. Because she starts with, um, instead of giving you just the steps and the counts, she gives you like an attitude, uh -huh. and like mood and I really like that because I think it's, you almost learn the steps differently with a different attitude. Um, mm. Just the way you approach them, you learn the music differently, um, you, you know, um, pe pick up on specific notes um, or specific tones. So it's, I really like, and I really like her description. I, it's interesting. I, I really like the idea of, um, I used to play it a certain way. And then I think I became a little bit softer as a dancer. I became a little more lyrical as the years went on. And when Alexi came back, um, he sent me a little note on Facebook. He was just like, when we were setting it to go to London, um, he told me, he's like, sharper, sharper, like more harsh, more harsh. Because to me, the idea of uh, like, almost making fun of, authority. The way I think of making fun of authority is to make it like um, like a facade, like super, superfluous, like, like ornamentation as a detriment, not ornamentation as like a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just like everything over the top, but I almost thinking of like royalty. That's the way I was approaching it. And he was like, no, it's, it's much more like you still have to show that you're like 
like militarized mm -hmm. authority through strength instead of authority through, um, you know, rococo, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like you can definitely see that, like there's that point where you're doing those on on point, on point, on point, and it's very, you know, it's just like, it's got this yeah. sort of driving sense to it. Yeah, but on the top, it's all like, yeah, and it's like over the top, and it's just like like I I would think of like I think of the part as like like a little kid um, mm -hmm. that doesn't know better would like do something just like happy to be there and happy to be just using the tools and without having really thought about what tools they're using and how they're using them, right? There is not really like that much layering behind um so it's like ignorance and happiness portrayed in a specific way and at the same time harsh right um it's just it's very hard to be harsh with a smile like yeah. i don't know if it's a spanish thing but like i it's just hard <laughs> that's really interesting um jana You've performed principal roles in Ratmansky Ballets, um, in Chamber Symphony, for example. Um, also, you did Cupid in his Don Quixote while at PMB. And then also in the ensemble here in Symphony Number no. 9. And I was wondering if you could comment on how it is different dancing in the ensemble in a Ratmansky Ballet versus performing one of the soloist roles. Yeah, that's a good question. Um... Cupid was fun. I remember it had, I got to wear this sort of Farrah Fawcett blonde wig and uh, well, first of all, I should mention Ramonsky choreography is not easy. <laughs> uh, it's always been a very big challenge in my uh, dance career. I think it has something to do with the quickness, but also just the shifting of weight and the shifting of space and tone, he shifts very quickly. So yeah, I think when I when I approach his so, the soloist roles that I've done with him, um, it takes me a long time. I I go through many many layers of self discovery, and when I approach the core roles with his choreography, it's a lot of community. It's a lot of working with your fellow dancers and learning together and leaning on each other and not being afraid to lean on each other. Um, when you're alone, you're alone. You have the other people that are learning the part. You have the other people on stage there to, to support you. But at the end of the day, when you're dancing, the focus is on you. I mean, <laughs> the, of course, audience members will be looking at everything, but you're doing a solo. So that's your moment. And as, as a corps de ballet, you, your moment is everyone's moment. It's understanding the same intention. It's understanding the same timing, the same shapes, the same movements. So it's a lot of discovery with each other. And, um, but I, yeah, I have to say with uh, Symphony Number no. 9 was difficult too because I was pretty new. Uh, the company had done it before and I wasn't part of that. Um, so I definitely felt a little bit like <laughs> the squeaky wheel, just like asking tons of questions and um yeah like Dora said I'd be in the wing like can you please tell me when I'm supposed to enter um so yeah that was fun and also with Cupid it was I was really young in my career and I was so anxious and I was so excited and just ready to try anything so you know I put that blonde wig on and I was like yes <laughs> this is my time give it to me um <laughs> which is I mean I still have a bit of that fire but when you're young it's it's much brighter uh but yeah it's always been a a, a big learning experience for Ramonsky choreography <laughs> musically and and physically <laughs> yeah I, well I was gonna add, I mean this kind of leads into my next question and you've already sort of answered it Jana, but the question is, you know, how would you say Ratmansky's movement vocabulary differs from other choreographers, other contemporary choreographers? That's a good question. <laughs> um, he, he definitely demands uh, qualities of the entire body that were different for me. Uh, I explained it a little bit before, but 
something that came to mind was the seasons uh when when i were i was cast in the winter section and um Doris was there too. So there's this part where you're doing like little seasons with your feet. So you're jumping scissors and then your upper body is like doing this slow, thick movement. And for a dancer, that step is microscopic. It, it's like three to the right and three to the left. It only appears once in the piece and that's it. But Nancy Rafa was on our case about that specific movement for a very, very long time. We practiced those jumps I mean, for probably 25 minutes a day for like a three week process. And so it's interesting because uh, Alexei's choreography, what I've found is he is very specific and also not specific at the same time. And that's where he differs. He, he gives you his opinion and his ideals without projecting. And then he lets the dancers do what they do with it and guides with what he wants. And that's different for me from my personal experience with contemporary choreographers, a lot of times choreographers will come in with very clear views or very um, open to interpretation. And Alexei is kind of this in between that um, allows you to explore, but is specific. And on top of it, just the steps are just really difficult. I mean, some of the girls are doing like quadruple pirouettes, like changing their feet and I don't know, ponches on point. In Chamber Symphony, we have to do this like 10 count balance, like <laughs> changing from like a shoulder to a hand. So he, he demands technical, but he, uh, just brings his own artistry. It's really, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, um, may I? Yes, please. Oh, well, I <laughs> can ask you the same thing. Jenna, <laughs> um, I I agree completely with Jenna. I I think like to me something that's very specific about Alexi is like he cares a lot about musicality. He cares a lot about intention. But the thing, the one thing I could imitate, I'm not going to because these pants might fall off or not. Otherwise, I would imitate him right now. He really cares about dynamics and the way he shows them and the way Nancy is able to. Nancy is like, if it, it's incredible. Like she can do all of the things that he really wants. You can see in the way she teaches uh, Steph, it's, it's incredible. Um, I think the dynamics, he likes this, uh, even though it's very classical and it's, I mean, we all know that his, um, you know, motif per se is the idea, is like as a historian of ballet, like recollecting and re mm -hmm. bringing back certain steps or like certain um, of that are you know obsolete um but even though they're not being used anymore the way he does them um they're so dynamic and because they're you know they're being done now with bodies of the 21st century it's very different because we are actually much more capable of doing we, we have trained in contemporary ballet, like right. neoclassical ballet. So like for us, getting from A to B, it's not just A and B, like contemporary dance in general, I think emphasizes the in-betweens emphasizes, and emphasizes dynamics. And funny enough, even though Alexei, it's very much a historian of ballet, um, his approach is quote unquote contemporary. And this is how, this is purely my own take on this. Like nobody quote me on this. I have not heard this anywhere. He would probably disagree completely. But from the outside, to me, it's, it looks like that. It looks like a step that could have been obsolete because it could have been done in a very tame way. It's now being done with the dynamics and bigger, to a degree, even mm -hmm. though he likes really small stuff, but then the next step is very big. So right. he likes contrast of movement. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. It seems like um, just from watching you all, it seems like you really have to use, um, not to get too technical here, but you really have to use your plie and you really have to use like your body weight in order to make that happen. Um, and one thing that I, I found interesting watching Nancy staging the seasons on you all was um, 
it almost seemed to me like she wanted you to get the dynamics of the step first mm -hmm. um, and then kind of color in the details later. Um, and it seems like, like maybe, you know, if we had to say what's one of the things that's most characteristic of his work is that dynamism. And like what you said, Doris, that's very contemporary. Um, so it is this really interesting mix of, of classical and contemporary. Um, I want to get back to symphony number nine though. And this is, this is a question that um, I'm always sort of curious about. And that's that we have this solitary man. There are four principals in the ballet, you know, two couples, and then this man who just kind of appears and he dances with the others, but he's also, you know, he's not partnered up, which is a little unusual. Um, I'm intrigued as to who you think this man might be, um, just using your own imagination or if you've had any thoughts about I mean, I, who he is. I think that in the, um, that person in the valley, I think they, we call him the dark angel. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a dark angel. But I don't think it's a dark angel in the sense of, you know, foreseeing death per se. I think it's the idea, I think the dark angel, this is once again, I'm just making all of this stuff. There is no reason but my own. Um, I do think that it's almost the dark angel person is the viewer to a degree or the person who like, it has perspective to see what's happening. Because mm -hmm. he appears and disappears and he keeps looking at both, um, mm -hmm. at like both couples and the core and, he's almost being like, he's an observer. And I, to me, I think that is the autobiographical, I think that's like a representation of Joseph Ovitz, but I don't know if that's what he meant, but that could be an interpretation. Um, it, yeah, it just seems like the person with a higher view. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he's called an angel kind of alludes to that, but once again, I'm just making this up. So. Well, there are no wrong interpretations, and that's that's a really interesting one. Um, Jana, do you have you thought about this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm again like Doris. I'm just making it up. Uh, I, I for some reason felt like he was somebody that lifted the veil a little. I don't know. Um, changed the perspectives and the view and. <laughs> <laughs> as I say it out loud, though, I'm I not I'm agreeing, with you. I'm disagreeing with myself as you speak. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. I think, that, but maybe that's the point too. Is that like as soon as you try to figure him out, <laughs> you think of something else. Um, it's kind of parallel to that ballet in a sense. <laughs> you, as soon as you you feel like you have the mood figured out, then like a very dramatic paw comes on. So. That's I yeah that's a good question but we did call him the dark angel but I, I agree I don't think he's like bringing everyone to death if anything I thought it was kind of the opposite he's like <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah mm. you I think that I don't know, if I were to be the audience I think that is the person that I would relate most with mm. um just because it's an observer so I don't know if it's like a way for people to relate to look at the story from his perspective it's almost like being a writer in the ballet mm -hmm. okay or maybe uh, like somebody who's reading i want to i want to text nancy so bad <laughs> also, it's like Easy. talk about dynamic like those those men were coached so long about getting the right dynamic. Not that they as dancers weren't capable, but like we've been talking about, it's just very specific. <laughs> and so we, we have so much rigidity in that piece. And then that dancer is so fluid and soft. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. something to think about too. <laughs> I think Emma is realizing the fact that the way the casting, like, the cast, the way the casting is done with certain dancers, it really, I'm, it, I'm starting to realize it might be um, a portrayal of Joseph Ovitz just because of the softness and like the mirror, like, mm. like tendencies. 
and at the same time like you know thoughtful and giving so I think like yeah like way Francisco Pansquito like all of these people are they're you know they could be described as such it's, uh, that's interesting so their personality kind of matches that that they can do that somehow I I think it's like I don't know why I end up with the mean person all the time the mean <laughs> or the dumb person I'm like something needs to change I need to change my <laughs> Um, <laughs> so um you know in the ballet there are all of these images of um watchfulness um people looking um there's this sense of persecution of fear um and of course these relate to Shostakovich's world and that Soviet era um you know none of us grew up in the Soviet <laughs> Union. Um, so I'm wondering how you relate to that time period, um, not having had that that experience of, of being under such an intense um, fear. Well, I, I don't know about fear, but I definitely think that we live in the ultimate, you know, time of era of surveillance. Uh. <laughs> so it's like if anyone doesn't relate to that today, they might want to just cancel their Facebook right now. Um, I yeah, I mean I think like it's more timely than ever. I think that ballet has actually become more timely as years went by. Um, sadly, yeah, I think like I don't fear it, but that is also something to fear. Because I think it's I think surveillance nowadays. Before it was very clear the wall was there, right? You could see the enemy behind the wall. Right now, the, there is no the wall is it's a glass wall, and the enemy is not necessarily at a distance where you can see it. So I think it's in a way I think you one could say that you know right now we could actually be more fearful than. Because before you could like acknowledge it and revolt. Mm -hmm. Now, who against whom? You know. Yeah, very interesting. Jana, do you yeah. have some thoughts? Yeah. On? yeah, I think that was a great point. Yeah. <laughs> like I was coming from a very um, <laughs> like artistic, I guess, point of view. But I, I, it's actually just making me think a lot what Doris said. So I like that. And my initial reaction was kind of that. Um, we're in a time of our lives where everything is at our fingertips to learn. Um, movies, internet, TV, just so much where I would hope as an artist to read those things, uh, to really feel a sort of empathy for them and, and do my best as a person who's the storyteller to deliver that. I don't think that I would ever relate, you know, because I've, um, it was a tough time, but I think that like Doris is saying, if, if you feel, if you see the, the parallels in our own life and you've been exposed to what those people have been through, there's a shift in your brain that you have to realize that that's your job now doing this ballet, doing ballet and arts in general, that you are telling the stories of the people that didn't have the opportunity to tell or don't have the opportunity or are silenced. Um, so it's tough. I mean, ballets like this are kind of tough mentally because it's dark. It's dark material, but it's also just like the music. It has these upbeat sort of jolly aspects. And um, I think that that's a great way to see the world sometimes is that with so much darkness you have these like people you know just acting like everything's okay or you know obviously we could go very deep on <laughs> that conversation but I really like what what Doris said and and um yeah that's my, my biggest hope is that as a storyteller to have the empathy to to tell these stories but yeah <laughs> I, Jenny, I agree completely like I think that um I think actually like ballet art in general, it's now is the time for the arts in the sense like we are ha gonna have to construct a new reality eventually because obviously this isn't working. Um, and I think like 
what a better way to do it than with fiction? That be film, um, books, um, or ballet. And I think, you know, ballet, like stage theater, stage, the stage is very powerful because you see there's, it's like a complete, like immersive experience where you see, you hear, and you're sitting down, you're focused on it. You don't have like somebody texting you. It's, you know, it's, and I think it's, it could be used in a very, as an act, you know, you could be a choreographer activist easily use this. Um, and I think this ballet, once again, once, once he finds out that I'm saying these things, I don't know, but I do think that that ballet is a great example of art as the architecture for the future in the sense that it can show you what it could have been or what reality could be, and then you make your own decisions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's like, once again, one of the most timely ballets like ever. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, yeah, the, the fiction allows us to see, uh, imagine a different reality. And, right. and we, we speak in stories, like we, that's the biggest difference between us and animals, right? Like we have these common stories this, um, that we all believe and that's how society like evolves. And I think like, it's basically fiction. We all believe in the same fictions. And the idea of, we are the most, like we are essential workers, easily one of the most essential workers today, I would think, I would say. One can, you know, if you think the way I think. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to do more interpreting. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's so, it's just fascinating to hear what you have to say. But um, this is a question for both of you. Uh, what do you think wins in the end of this ballet, pessimism or optimism? Um, I don't think there's a winner necessarily. Um, I think like because it everybody dissipates but the author right like what well, we've mm. like i've got no we i've come to a conclusion is the author <laughs> um but the dark I, angel the it, dark angel it, remains on the stage he's the last person like, like like strolls around him and mm -hmm. everybody just dissipates the stage real quickly and he stays there by himself alone which is a very interesting ending um and I think is once again, is the idea of like, and after this, what are you gonna do, right? It's this idea of like, now meditate on this, just go home and ponder. Um, that's my take on it. I think like everything in life, there is both sides almost all the time. No, no, not always. I've just said something Trump said and I was like, that's not what I meant, um, but you can see things and, and perspectives are a great thing and different ways to look at things are a great thing. But then you have to yourself have your own point of view. And I think like, I, to me, that's what it kind of represents, the idea of like, you know what? Mm. Wow. Yeah. And I think it's a new, as an audience member, as a dancer, it's uh, the shifting of perspective of if you were seeing peasant pessimism and then you were unveiled to optimism how is that shifting and then vice versa I also think it's interesting that because the ballet explores so many emotions as a human being what I've always found is to not stray away from emotions like even the darker ones being fear being mad being um anger sadness because to to have those emotions makes you understand them um uh, but as you go forward in life, whether you use that to help or to hurt is, is you as a person, your decision. Um, so it's, it's interesting to, to look at the end of the ballet with the dark angel jumping in the air and then the lights go out, right? Because as an audience member, what are you left with? It's like your final breath. As a viewer, his final breath as a dancer, everyone that exits the stage 
all with a final note, a final breath, a final light. So you can take that initial response and think, oh, what did I just feel? Or you can take that initial response and, and figure out where that response is coming from. Like what parts of the ballet stuck out to your, to your mind the most? What parts were you uh, ignorant to in the moment that later you looked back on and found, wow, that was something that was really powerful to me. So I think it's an interesting ending because it opens up this huge world of opportunity of diving into your own mind and, and understanding of, of what you want the ending to be and why. And uh, yeah, it's, it's complex. So yeah, I don't know if there's an answer, but yeah. <laughs> And I like the way you look at things because you look at things from like an emotional point of view, which is very interesting. It's just because that's kind of the point of seeing ballet. <laughs> Not always, you know, but a lot of the times that's what they want you to, that's it, you know, that's the aim. Um, and you have exactly that reaction, which is like, how did I feel instead of I think my point of view is like analyzing all of, you know, and I think like you might actually be much closer to what he meant than me. Like, I think we just make a perfect things. pair. I think we make like a perfect match like because with the analyzing and the emotions, it's like a, <laughs> we could write a book. <laughs> you should, you should, yeah. Well, Doris, it's like you're thinking of it as the viewer thinks of it. And then Jana, you're thinking of it as, as you experience it, mm -hmm. um, it seems, perhaps. Um, okay, last question, because I think we're just about out of time. Um, well, you mentioned moments that pop out, of, out to you in the ballet. And I was wondering if you could just talk about one or two of those moments and, and why it pops out to you. Um, from a dancer point of view or from like, if I were to look at the back, like what? Because <laughs> I have many stories about dancing in general, like, but... Um, either one. Either one. I really, it's one of those balance that it's just really nice to be part of. It's, it's just very nice to be part of. Mm. Um, you feel like, I know, Jana, you were talking about being in the core, being as a whole. I really like ballets that um, they make you feel as a whole, even when you're a principal. Um, and I think, to me, those are the best ballets to watch, even. Um, ensemble ballets, there is such, like the the power of a group, it's very hard. It's just very, very, like you have to be insane. And even then you will touch a certain part of, you know, in people, but not, you know, it's like marching on the street. Like when you see marches on the street and it moves you, it's the same idea. It's like people moving together is one of the most beautiful things, I think, mm -hmm. if not the most beautiful thing in the world. And the thing about Alexis is that at the end, the, you know, at, in symphony number nine, uh, the principles disappear into the core. And that happens quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just, as a dancer, I really enjoy that. I like being part of, and also you just get to have little chats in rehearsals with people. You're not just by yourself in the corner, like hoping somebody will, you know, go on top. Um, so it just becomes a social thing. And I think it's, I, especially now more than ever, I'm looking back at those moments and be like, you know what I enjoy the most? Talking to like, you know, right before we went, dun, 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 dun. like that little moment there, Jenna, like yeah. stuff like that. Thinking back, it's one of my favorite things. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I definitely think there's um, often a strong sense of community in, in his ballets and then um, that also correlates to, you know, what you experience when you're working together and making art together, which is so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, something that sticks out for me also because Doris is here right now is like there's this part where my part like presents her <laughs> and she comes on doing this really hard stuff yeah and um, it was always so fun because we'd like catch each other's eye right before she came on like are you ready okay <laughs> you know <laughs> um, that part was always so fun and then just that sense of community like there were so many moments that um, we would be standing in that box just waiting you know for rehearsal to start or something and you'd just be laughing with everyone and of course like I'd be stuck next to Diego who would be like pulling my hands down like trying to make me touch the ground like joking around and just um like Doris said the, that those things I completely am once again reminded in my life that I need to not take those moments for granted because they were they you they make you grow they make the the group around you, you feel special, like you're part of something, you are yourself, you're part of something. And it's just, yeah, his ballets really bring that. So symphony number no. nine, I'll just, I'll never forget that. Just so many moments, like <laughs> just as a big group. Well, hopefully you'll get to perform it again soon. <laughs> yeah, along with the seasons too. Hopefully we'll get to see that. Um, I really like of his. Um, sorry, I think I'm no, no, please go ahead. Um, seven sonatas. Um, yeah, jazz is it's one of the hardest ballads I've ever done. Um, but that is the ultimate sense of community. Like you enter as a group, you exit as a group. Yeah. You have to be together. Um, everybody, and you don't have a lot of four principles to work that way is very rare mm. um, and actually we can and we can do it very well and some dancers that you're like I don't know how this is gonna go they're you know they're they haven't really been in the core or you know that was a long time ago and then you realize that oh no no they're very capable of it and they actually the way especially I have to say the way principal women can communicate about like making a decision together, to me was one of those, the things that I, um, Seven Sonatas, I remember very clearly, mm -hmm. like um, Lorena and Sof, Sophia, just like going like, guys, like what leg are we gonna start on? How are we gonna do this? How many steps? Like, like just decisions, making decisions. And, and it was very interesting. I'm like, oh, this is, this is how things look good. But, yeah communicating and working together and just thinking that's like a group. Yeah, yeah I, I would think that would, that ballet has such a sense of intimacy mm -hmm. um, and a sense of community. It's interesting how that's, that's created. And I imagine that you would have to work together closely in order to, to have that feeling and to make that happen. Yeah, I hope, I hope we'll bring that ballet back as well. <laughs> Um, well, I can't thank you both enough. Um, this has been a really, really interesting conversation and um, it's great to see both of you. And, um, you know, I just hope this will all end soon. <laughs> we can be back together. Fantastic. What a great conversation. Truly uh, lots of points of views uh, we got to hear tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Doris. Um, these conversations are just so uh, important to have, especially now. So we appreciate your time and your participation. And I'd just like to invite our guests to go to the website to learn more about the digital season and our other educational offerings. So thanks again.